I met Norman Borlaug and John Niederhauser at a seminar of the American Institute of Biological Sciences at Madison, Wisconsin uh, in 1953. I was then working in the genetics department of that university uh, on potatoes and John Niederhauser and I had several ideas to share. Norman Borlaug, uh, who was always concerned with the scientific checkmating of the menace caused by wheat rust, the stripe rust, the brown rust, and the stem rust, he immediately felt that there is need for developing a more enduring f form of resistance to all the three rust, the leaf rust, the stripe rust, and the stem rust. And he developed a methodology by which phenotypically the variety will be identical, but genotypically it will be somewhat divergent in terms of genetic makeup. This is a very interesting concept of developing enduring resistance. I returned to India in 1954 and then started work first in rice and then later on wheat in terms of varieties which are responding to fertilizer and water. The reason for this was that India's independence in 1947 was born in the background of the great Bengal famine where over three million children, women and men died out of hunger. So when we became independent, the first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru rightly felt that we must produce more food by using the latest technology. He gave importance to large irrigation projects like the Bakra Nangal. Uh, he was influenced by his visit to the United States. The Tennessee Valley Authority impressed him. He promoted fertilizer factories, pesticide factories, irrigation projects. And above all, he also was responsible for starting agriculture universities, uh, first at Pantnagar uh, in the state of Uttarakhand, uh, which was uh, uh, patterned on the land-grant college principle of the U.S., started by Abraham Lincoln 151 years ago. Uh, the Indian land-grant college system has now expanded to more than 65 universities across the country. In spite of the fact that we could apply fertilizer and uh, do more irrigation, we found in the late 1950s our then cultivated varieties of wheat, rice and other crops did not respond to good soil fertility or irrigation water. This is because they had a kind of plant architecture which made them fall down uh, when more nutrients were given. This is where the search for new genes, uh, the norin dwarfing genes, uh, occurred and uh, we knew that the norin dwarfing genes from originally uh, from Gonzero in Azuka in the Norin Experiment Station had gone to Orville Vogel in the United States and to Norman Borlaug. I wrote to Norman Borlaug in the early 1960 requesting him to both send some material of the new dwarf varieties as well as visit India. It took some time for officialdom to process uh, my request. Ultimately, Norman Borlaug arrived in Delhi in 1963, uh, March. In fact, I still recall March 25, 1963, on his birthday, my wife had arranged uh, a, a party for him in the lawns of the genetics division of the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, where we had Mexican music and Mexican food. Uh, Dr. Borlaug was totally surprised and naturally also happy. What he did was to leave uh, from India to Pakistan and study the material he had already sent to Pakistan a couple of years earlier. From there he made a selection of varieties segregating population and sent them to us uh, in September 1963. At my request he also sent bulk quantities of seeds of four released varieties in Mexico, Lerma Rojo 64A, Sonora 63, Sonora 64, and Mayo 64. Uh, we immediately, as soon as the seeds arrived, split them into a number of parts, sent to Lodhiana, Kanpur, Pantnagar, Pusad, 
Indore, uh, of course Delhi, uh, for a multi-location testing. And uh, at the end of 63, uh, what we call the rabbi season, or the winter season, uh, in April 63, uh, when I analyzed all the data re received from the different stations, all of them uniformly showed that the new dwarf varieties are capable of yielding three to four times more than the earlier tall varieties. Uh, then came the question of uh, speeding up what we call purchase of time, because India uh, was leading a precarious existence on the food front, what was called a ship-to-mouth existence. Every year, the import of PL-480 wheat increased, and in 1966, it reached a level of 10 million tons. Uh, many eminent authorities like Paul and William Paddock and uh, Paul and Anne Ehrlich had practically written off India under the triage high, high classification as a country which cannot save itself. It is under those conditions a new uh, hope, a new ray of uh, hope was uh, born with the arrival of Norman Borlaug um, and this material. Uh, we found that we have now an opportunity. Fortunately, in 1964, middle of 64, a Minister for Agriculture, Mr. C. Subramaniam, uh, came in scenario. He was one who was convinced that science uh, can show the path uh, to increasing food production. Of course, Jawaharlal Nehru, first Prime Minister, who started the agriculture universities, also was very convinced about science. But nevertheless, Subramaniam uh, gave the kind of support which was needed. Uh, to cut a long story short, from 1964 to 68, 68 when we released a stamp, special stamp called the Wheat Revolution, to mark a quantum jump in the improvement of uh, production uh, from about 10 million tons to 17 million tons, more than what was achieved in the previous 4,000 years from the days of Mahanjadaro uh, to the Independence Day. In those days, uh, what was important is to get the public policy support in terms of seed production, in terms of fertilizer, in terms of pesticide, and above all, assured and remunerative marketing. After all, assured and remunerative marketing is the best fertilizer for the farmer. Now, Mr. Subramaniam set up a number of institutions, the Food Corporation of India, under the chairmanship of TAPI, and uh, the Agricultural Prices Commission, which was now called Agricultural Costs and Prices Commission, headed by Dr. Ashok Gulati. Uh, many of these uh, very important instruments uh, were created. So uh, the package of technology was supported by package of public policies and package of services like seed production. In fact, we introduced a number of innovations. Uh, it was a decade of innovation in the case of wheat research. For example, agronomic innovations involved uh, giving, uh, sowing the seed uh, at a, in a shallow, shallow sowing, and also giving the first irrigation at the crown root initiation. Uh, the extension uh, innovation was the national demonstration program, where we took the seeds of the new varieties to the poorest farmer in the village, because I was always convinced that whatever you demonstrate in a rich farmer's field, the result will be attributed to affluence, not to technology. This is why I insisted although government had some reservation that we should go to the poorest farmer's field in the national demonstration program. The national demonstration uh, created such a craving for seeds that uh, we persuaded the government to import 18,000 tons of seeds of the Mexican varieties. Also, our breeders under the All India Coordinated Wheat Improvement Project, uh, carried by Dr. Joshi, Dr. Kohli, and many other, M, Dr. M. B. Rao. Dr. M. B. Rao and many other leading people immediately converted the Mexican red varieties into amber varieties like Kalyan Sona, Sonalika, because in India, uh, red color is not preferred for the unleavened bread called chapati making. So a whole series of technological transformation, agronomic transformation, public policy transformation, and above all, the enthusiasm of the farmers, after all, we can help the farmer, but the farmer who works in sun and rain, farm and farm woman, they work in sun and rain and produce the food which we all eat. Therefore, the 60s was a period of great acceleration that we could prove the prophets of doom wrong 
and as a result in 1968 Indira Gandhi released a stamp called the Wheat Revolution which had on on its uh, on the stamp the library building of the Indian Agricultural Research Institute New Delhi as a symbol of the introduction of science into agriculture uh, Dr Borlaug used to come from 1963 onwards to India visit almost every year uh, India uh, go through the experimental plot Uh, not only his visit was not only important for sharing some scientific ideas but more importantly for the enthusiasm he brought into the work and for the tremendous uh, tremendous conviction that we can overcome we can overcome the problem of hunger and poverty i am therefore happy uh, that a year before dr borlaug's uh, birth centenary that is 2013 the government of india uh, introduced a, in in parliament a bill called the national food security bill uh, which confers the right to food the social protection against hunger has been now extended by a legal right to over 75% of india's population so from the bengal famine uh, to sh- uh, from ship to mouth to right to food with home grown food is one of the most fascinating stories uh, of in the history of indian in the history of in not only indian agriculture but the world agriculture and also in the history of human efforts to fight hunger and in this we owe to dr borlaug the enthusiasm uh, the which he brought to this and the conviction the compassion which he brought which were all infectious to me personally those years uh, of with dr borlaug particularly the 60s when we had the great excitement of prov- proving all the prophets of doom wrong uh, is the most uh, most exhilarating part of my life and uh, i i wish the borlaug legacy uh, in the second uh, century of his life uh, will enthuse very large number of young people to take on the job of a hunger free world with vigor and determination